Welcome, I'm Carla Spilottini. I'm producer of Starts Prize here at Ars Electronica. Starts is an initiative of the European Commission to foster alliances between science, technology and the arts. Starts Prize, uh, that's a project that we are doing together with Wach Society in Amsterdam and Bozar in Brussels, is meant to find, promote and award the best practice projects of these innovative collaborations. What you see behind me is Anatomy of an AI System, uh, this project by um, Kate Crawford and Vlad Yola received an honorary mention in last year's Starts Prize. And it's really an amazing art of work that you might need some hours to really, really look and get into. Um, but without further ado, let me present to you the talk that uh, our partner Wach Society, and more specifically Lucas Evers there, is presenting. He's talking with Andrea Ling, our this year's Starts Prize awardee of the artistic exploration category. She's having a conversation with Brenda Parker of the University College of London. So yes, um, welcome again, uh, everybody. Um, my name is Lucas Evers. I work for uh, Bach in Amsterdam. We're an institute that uh, looks at how technology manifests itself in society and ecology and how vice versa. Uh, there is mutual effects. Um, and as part of uh, WAG, uh, we are also involved in uh, working with the European Commission um, to organize um, projects within uh, the starts, the larger starts project of uh, the European Union. So START stands for Science, Technology and the Arts. And it's a, a family of uh, projects uh, with residencies, uh, lighthouse calls, um, the prize, the Starts Prize, uh, all meant to look into how the arts can be a source of inspiration uh, for technology development to make that more inclusive um, and more innovative for society. Um, we have the great honor uh, this evening uh, to welcome uh, two speakers. Uh, first is uh, Andrea Ling, who is this year's Starts Prize winner. Uh, in the category of artistic exploration. And there's another Starts Prize that is given to Olga Kiseleva, with whom we will have another Starts Talk later uh, this season uh, for um, uh, collabor collaborative practices. Um, after um, the presentation of uh, Andrea Ling, uh, we will listen to uh, an expert in the field, biochemist, Dr. Brenda Parker, who will give a short overview of her work and then give a reflection on uh, the work of Andrea Ling. Thereafter, uh, I welcome everybody to, uh, to come up with questions um, and I will moderate uh, a discussion between uh, Andrea, Brenda and you as, uh, as audience here in this call. Um, in uh, the conversation afterwards, we're going to, to uh, a little bit uh, focus on three areas, um, but maybe there will be more coming from the reflection of, uh, uh, of Brenda Parker, uh, and maybe even more coming for you, from your questions. But we're going to discuss maybe the field of new uh, design language uh, required when we start designing with living systems. Uh, new language of ge geometry, or of the, the duration of design processes. We'll also look into uh, uh, models of uh, collaboration, collaboration like, for instance, uh, that uh, of Andrea Ling with the MIT-based Ginkgo Bioworks, but also um, collaborations like the Starts Residencies. And uh, as last, I think it's also interesting to, to look at um, how maybe the development of biodesign will challenge also uh, design uh, as a value system within our economy. Um, I want to give the words to, to Andrea, uh, who comes from MIT. You did your master's with, um, if I'm right, the Mediated Matter Group of MIT. And later you developed the work actually that was awarded the, the Starts Prize of this year in a residency with a more biology-oriented uh, group of uh, Ginkgo Bioworks. 
Um, yeah, uh, it's difficult to ask uh, uh, an applause from the audience in this uh, setup, but uh, um, I really uh, uh, look forward to seeing your presentation. So please uh, um, share your screen and um, yeah, tell us what you are developing. And thereafter, we'll, uh, we'll switch to uh, Brenda. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, thank you, Lucas, for the introduction and for inviting me. Um, okay, can you see this? Yes. You thinking from a test? Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about my background, the context as well, and then go into the projects um, for mediated matter as well as um, the Ginkgo, um, Ginkgo residency. So um, I am Andrea, and I'm an architect. Uh, an installation artist, and I have a background in human physiology and cell research. And so I currently work at the intersection of design, fabrication technologies, and the biological sciences. Um, so uh, after I graduated, I spent three years working for Philip Peasley, um, working on a series of immersive interactive sculptures for Philip that Philip considers as um, near living in their ability to respond and change with uh, human presence. Um, and so these are some of the drawings and documentation um, that we would do for him. Um, and what's interesting about these sculptures is that uh, he considers them near living because they don't just enclose the human body, but instead um, uh, often you, know, you interact with it um, and um, they often encroach on the human body. Um, and I also worked on a series of plastic textiles for his first collaboration uh, with Iris and Kirkin. Um, so at the same time as working for Philip, I had my own design practice with some friends. We worked mostly in public art, and we do these really large-scale kinetic installations um, that were concerned about uh, maximizing the amount of connection and interaction that people have with artwork and, and um, maximizing interactivity. Um, and some of them are still under construction today. And so I, I'm, I was an, this architect who had a general interest in designing responsive environments and responsive skins. Um, and combined with my science background, that led me to become a research assistant um, for the Mediated Matter Group at MIT. And so I'm sure most of you are familiar with Mediated Matter. Um, it's led by Neri Oxman, and it's a group of architects, um, scientists, computational designers, um, and engineers that work together on projects that leverage nature as a design partner um, and fabrication partner. Um, and so the group will develop platforms um, to work with biological agents like insects or microbes and other biologically derived materials as design agents to access the built-in responsivity and liveliness from the systems. Um, so you can see here this little silkworm. Um, when we removed his z-axis, he, he, he needs to find, he still wants to spin, he has to spin or else he'll die. Um, and instead of spinning the cocoon, if you just, he'll just do a planar surface once you remove um, his branch. Um, but my main project in Mediated Matter was on the biomaterials team, working on Aguilera 1, which is a series of artifacts in a five meter tall pavilion that's made out of biocomposites. Um, and so this is the project team, and I want to stress that, you know, this is a group project that took over two years. It took like four full-time research assistants and a bunch of part-time people to, to do the scale of work. Um, and it took like, different skills in computational design, fabrication, material science, and architecture to do this. Um, and so the project is the development of this water-based composite system of natural sugars of chitosan, cellulose, and pectin. And here, and these are the artifacts that we, we printed over the span of two years, um, testing things like uh, different material compositions and different type of tool paths um, to see what we can do with this material. Um, and what's interesting is that these composites are just complex sugars, and so they give us a water-dependent system that's biodegradable and biocompatible. Um, and so here's the custom robotic fabrication system that was developed by Jorge and Daniel. Um, it's capable of depositing uh, different proportions of different materials in specific locations in order to vary um, mechanical properties and material properties. So I'll put different amounts of different things in different areas, and, but all as one functionally graded object. 
Um, and so, yeah, you can functionally grade these composites at architectural scale um, by designing things like material composition, tool path, and print conditions. And then you can get this library of like strength, color, translucency, flexibility, and other properties. Um, and this is all done uh, just playing with the ratios of these three base ingredients and the physical parameters around um, those ingredients. Um, yeah, and so because we could functionally grade these materials, my question was how to make the most of behavior such as this, where you can get differential deformation based on material com composition. Um, and could you design things like responsivity and degradation rate as induced by humidity or water? Um, so how could you respond to like slowly failing structural capacity that occurs in response to these changing environmental conditions? Um, so like I, I extended this work further um, during my creative residency at Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, so Ginkgo is a synthetic biology company. They design organisms or the metabolites of organisms um, and they can do their design work at scale with the use of automation. So that means they can test um, many different versions of organisms fairly rapidly and much more quickly than um, we could do so in our in um, an artisanal lab. Um, so they're starting to look more seriously at bioremediation as a research and as a business path. Um, and they're exploring new ways that their technologies can assist in designing this remediated carbon cycle of the future. Um, so they host this residency every year to explore um, with art and design the potential that synthetic biology and genome engineering can have on designing sustainable futures. So Ginkgo's thing for my year was how to design a world without waste. Um, and so my response is to reframe the nature of waste as something that's both unavoidable and unacceptable. So unavoidable in that currently as an architect and as a designer, all I do is design waste or what will be waste. And it's unacceptable in that with proper design, I think waste should not exist. Um, so I wanted to design waste as nature designs it. Um, so not only as a product of breakdown, um, but also as inputs for renewal. Um, and so Design by Decay is a series of artifacts that exhibit design decay. So it incorporate enzymes, bacteria, and fungus, and other biological agents um, into the material as ways of decomposing and composing matter at the same time. Um, some of the questions I had were, could you spatially and temporally guide when and where decay might occur? And could you harness it so that, like in nature, it can be used constructively and able to assist in the creation of new artifacts or change existing ones while degrading matter? And then also, given that autonomous biological organisms are the decay agents, um, how can a designer accommodate agency and variation within the design process where the unexpected might result, but you are still okay with that? Um, so the base material system I was using um, was the one that I learned how to use in mediating matter. So chitosan, cellulose, pectin. And in the first set of samples, I took enzymes that were derived from fungus and human saliva and integrated them into the biocomposites. And with some sort of crude spatial and temporal control um, in order to transform the material rather than simply destroy it. And so we, I was trying to employ degradation as a fabrication process. Um, and so the deterioration that results is tunable by varying, varying things like enzyme concentration and the amount of time that you keep the active enzyme on the material and which enzyme you use. Um, and so you, the areas with the kind of powdery residue is what you see um, where, where the enzymes are working. Um, and as a point of comparison, I laser cut a bunch of the biomaterial samples as well. So I would create these really industrially precise um, pieces um, so that when I compare them with the enzyme ones, um, the enzyme degradated lines were of very poor resolution um, as the enzymes would diffuse through like these semi-like colloids um, and then you would get much more blurry lines. But um, I think it's still usable um, you just, if you adjust expectation. Um, and so some of the more compelling results were with these little tripod structures I was making um, where I used the enzymes to, to subtract holes from, from the material or like uh, subtract some of the perimeter material. And so the objects created, although they're not identical, they're similar enough to each other that I could aggregate them with some sort of consistency. 
um, in, in the second set of tests I was doing, I learned how to work with uh, different strains of Streptomyces, which is a common soil bacteria, and it's a secondary decomposer that produces um, and jasmine, the, the compound responsible for soil cells. And so uh, next slide, Chiesa used the same bacteria during her residency at Ginkgo to naturally dye silk with, with, her, with these bacteria. And she made these beautiful um, textiles. Um, and so I wanted to use the same bacteria to transform cellulose and other, other different bioplastics. Um, so I was able to culture um, the streptomyces in sterile conditions onto plant cellulose and into like wood substrates, except um, it was very, very difficult to um, get any of the streptomyces to grow on the on a bioplastic. So I only got it to work a few times. Um, and so while we knew that the bacteria that I was using was capable of producing celluloses and chitinases and then theoretically feed on these materials, sterilizing these composites without damaging them or producing toxic residues was an issue, um, as was like me, um, figuring out ways of precisely controlling um, where I'm pipetting if I'm doing it by hand. And so I was testing different means of spatial templating with the materials, you know, changing my pipetting technique to using antibiotics in certain areas to inhibit colonization and decomposition. And I was also exploring using Ginkgo's automation equipment to pipette in a more spatially precise manner. Um, and so my hope for these tests was that I could transform this cocoon structure that I had designed um, that was made out of the biocomposites and that as it decayed, I could change the color into a deep indigo with time, um, but it didn't work. And so I had, you know, I made this thing and I took some test strips and sterilized them and incubated them over 30 days. And what resulted was this white mold um, and no evidence of the streptomyces. And so I think it was a really interesting uh, lesson in kind of doing this work um, in a BL1 lab, um, rather than simply like burying my samples out in the soil, where, you know, because what I was working with wild strain bacteria, and I was just asking them to do what they would naturally do on um, like a dead tree stump or like decaying leaves or rotting fruit outside. Um, but because I was doing it in these really artificial conditions of a lab environment that demands sterilization, um, that uh, grow predominantly monocultures um, that are sensitive then to contamination by stronger strains of things. Um, it seemed to hinder rather than enable the growth of any of these bacteria. Um, and so it was a really interesting lesson on kind of the limitations of wet lab work and how, how artificial um, the setting is and, and how things don't work as they do outside in nature sometimes. Um, and what was also interesting was that you know, it allowed these, this other species of mold to flourish instead. Um, so my final set of tests was using different types of mold um, to decay objects um, in design patterns or like onto the, the carvings. Um, so I used Aspergillus niger, which is a black mold, and Trichodermy variety, a green mold. Um, and so these fung the, the fungus are extremely um, effective decomposers. And they're very hardy and resilient. And so, so they will probably outcompete any, uh, any um, other uh, strains of things out there. Um, and so here I was testing if I could spatially guide where the mold could grow and see at what point overgrowth would occur and like what conditions would um, encourage the molds to stay in the original bat pattern. And then I also tried co-culturing um, the different fungi in um, over the span of a month into these uh, large wooden blocks that have comput been computationally designed um, to increase the surface area for, for maximum colonization. Um, and so the Aspergillus colonized the block within a week, and then the Trichodermia needed two more weeks um, before you can start seeing the green areas. Um, and the growth pattern was interesting in that I had plated uh, the different species in different valleys, um, but they they would really start to mix together as they as they developed, um, and and um, then I had these two other blocks that showed really heavy contamination with other species, but were also um, interesting. So I think the point of this project was not to develop a product. Um, but instead outlines a process by which we could create artifacts where decay is built in. 
So not only as a means of disposal, but as a, as also as a potential fabrication process where you could transform objects in ways that are still acceptable to the user. Um, and these transformations are not always predictable or standardized, which is very inconvenient for industry. But given the state of climate crisis we're in, um, you know, I don't think we can uh, design primarily for human convenience anymore. And um, I think our current paradigms of design are insufficient in addressing climate crisis because they're founded on these premises of extraction and very narrow definitions of efficiency that are somewhat myopic. And they fail to look at ecological consequences. So it's why I'm interested in designing systems using biological entropy as a means of accessing new means of organization or construction is that I think they offer new paradigms. Um, so much of my focus is on developing fabrication techniques that allow for regenerative construction and design um, and that address modes of production, consumption, and disposal all together holistically rather than separately. Um, and so my goal for these material systems and these biological agents is not, is not to create this zero carbon footprint project or upcycle waste into new, new products, but instead it's to support a different mode of design where the process of making something and then breaking it is provisional rather than just consumptive. Um, and so design by decay means working at this intersection of design fabrication and biology to develop ways of redistributing value away from permanent material that might destroy ecosystems onto these transient ones that could potentially restore them. And so finding um, some sort of philosophical as well as practical value in designing responsivity, degradation, and renewal into many objects. And so I'll end with, oh, so yeah, Ginkgo is this company that designs life. And so they understand how in synthetic biology, long-term success comes from working in symbiosis with the underlying logic of natural systems, rather than trying to subjugate them to human life. And so as a classically trained architect, I'm used to having precise control over my output. You can kind of see that in my working drawings. Um, and so the struggle for a design practice like this is, is for me to learn how to accept all the embedded tensions where material and biological agency will sometimes work in contradiction to what I planned or what I'm comfortable with. Um, but if you learn to accept all these inconveniences and even work with them, I think you know, using decay to facilitate um, renewal offers like, extraordinary advantages, um, such as access to circular systems, and the ability to grow, adapt, and reproduce out of garbage, um, and providing this resilience that's not found in industrial systems. Um, and so I'm really looking at ways of shifting design away from these extractive paradigms with very narrow definitions of efficiency towards um, maybe softer paradigms that first address ecological consequence in order to take care of social and economic ones. Um, yeah, and this is, you know, my last image where part of the inspiration for my project was the 70,000 year old Bradshaw rock painting in Australia that's super vibrant despite its age. And they're really vivid because the original pigments um, had been decomposed, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of centuries ago. And so the original pigments decomposed and eaten by a symbiotic community of black fungus and red algae. And then that stayed within the confines of those drawings for thousands of years. Um, and they're symbiotic and growth conservative. And so they just stayed there and they feed each other um, and support each other into this like human, human-made drawing. Um, and it creates this material system that is, uh, that has existed far longer than any man-made system. And so it might seem odd for an architect to promote the design of transience as a design solution, but um, I think when working with natural systems, it's, it's the fact that nature's materials degrade and can reorganize that allow for a systems level longevity um, that's based out of renewal uh, rather than static robustness. Um, and this longevity is something that man-made materials are not capable of. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> So thank you. Yeah, and I don't know if you have questions or if Brenda wants to speak. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, that's, that's amazing. A, that's a fantastic presentation. Uh, unfortunately, the connection was a bit uh, shaky, but uh, oh, okay. I think uh, we're all we were all able to uh, 
to fully uh, follow you. Shoot, uh, you yeah, yeah, tried yeah. that once, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the video at some times was a little bit shaky, which was a pity, but um, I think uh, there are a lot of questions. I at least mm -hmm. also have a lot of questions, but um, yeah, uh, for reasons we invited uh, by your advice, Andrea, uh, uh, Brenda Parker of University College London, uh, who is a biochemist uh, working a lot with biodesign and looking into yeah, the same material qualities of the, the things you work with, uh, Andrea, to give a little bit of a reflection on your work by also a little bit explaining her work. Sure. So, uh, uh, Brenda, please um, share your screen and... Um, okay, everything, so. you can see everything? Yes, fantastic. Good. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Andrea. It's a real um, pleasure and a real privilege to actually give a response to your work. Um, um, I'm a big admirer of, of your work and I'm also a big supporter of the Ginkgo Creative Residency. I think it's a fantastic program. So um, just to introduce myself, I'm, I'm the co-director of the Biointegrated Design Program at UCL, uh, which is a conjoint um, effort between the Department of Biochemical Engineering uh, and the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London. So I'm, I'm uh, indeed trained as a biochemical engineer. And here is uh, the BioID lab. If you're ever passing through London, we'd be very happy to welcome you. There's Oren Katz in there uh, seeing what we're doing. Uh, and really what we try and do at BioID is to, to really embrace a lot of the things Andrea was, was showing in practice, which is to bring together laboratory work, fabrication and design, as well as sort of computation and, and more advanced manufacturing to, to really look at um, how we can push forward the idea of designing and, and manufacturing with biology. So the kind of things that obviously I think about or in, in, the, term, in the context of sort of biodesign or biointegrated design or uh, using uh, materials, as Andrea was mentioning, um, sort of trying to regenerate or make use of waste materials such as food waste. Um, to address ideas of um, sustainability through um, generative systems, so things like biophotovoltaics, generating energy, uh, and also to think about kind of cleaning the environment through, um, through the use of biological processes, so bioremediation as well. Just some of the themes that we consider uh, within our program uh, and some of the methods that we use to, to try and achieve this. So to try and uh, blend this idea of biological research, the kind of small scale and, and very delicate with some things that are much more robust and much more large scale. Um, and really the ambition here is and, and it's why we combined a biochemical engineering department with the School of Architecture is because our ambitions are uh, very much uh, aligned in terms of scale up and it's something I'd love to talk to you guys about a little bit more today uh, and also the idea of bringing things out of the lab environment uh, out of these very uh, highly controlled but yet very very small uh, scale environments like incubators and taking it out into the outdoors um, so lots and lots in common with what Andrea was doing and probably uh, a project that you might be familiar with that, that uh, we've been working on quite a bit recently is the Indus project. So this is really trying to design a system uh, where the abiotic and biotic components work together. Uh, so this is an algal based bioremediation system. So the idea is that the algae are immobilized in hydrogel material. Um, so they're supplied with uh, gases and they're supplied with water uh, and uh, the system is really used with the idea of making use of some of the properties of, of algae to capture heavy metals from wastewater. So this is just one project that we've been working on um, to, to scale up and to investigate the methods and modes of production. So that's just an introduction to me, and but now I'd really like to turn my attention much more to to what Andrea has been uh, presenting and addressing today. Uh, and I think, given the topic, it's only fair that we kind of maybe reference something like um, the Architects Declare uh, movement and really um, the kind of context in which this kind of design is operating. And we cannot, as Andrea mentioned literally designed as if we do not know that climate change is happening. We have to um, address issues of waste um, and, and emissions. 
And um, obviously we're very focused on CO2, but there are many other environmental impacts that we should be concerned about. But indeed the idea of uh, climate change, but also biodiversity loss um, are incredibly pressing. And it's fantastic to see a project like Andrea's addressing um, and questioning what it means to work with waste materials uh, in the context of um, architecture as well. So this is, of course, a diagram that many people will be uh, very familiar with. This is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and um, thinking about this kind of idea of cradle to cradle and reuse and remanufacture. And, and what was really interesting in Andrea's talk is that she's not actually really trying to feed into the system directly and in, in maybe in the incarnation that's presented here by the cradle to cradle model. But instead, she's trying to maybe question or look at maybe other loops that might be present um, in this kind of remodeling and remaking. And I, I was, I was, when I was reflecting on Andrea's work, I was um, recalling an essay by Nicholas uh, Georgescu Rogan. It was from 1977. I think it might even be in the book Grain Vapor Ray. It was about thermodynamic analysis and recycling and in, in the context of ecological salvation. And he uses the example of a pearl necklace and he says recycling is not literally like you have this beautiful pearl necklace and it it breaks and you just pick up the individual components off the floor. Um, recycling when it comes to this kind of complexity is much more like imagining the pearls are dissolved in, in acid and then you scatter it all over the ocean and you have to reclaim all of the individual parts. It's very difficult, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's incredibly difficult and very, very slow and would probably require an infinite amount of time. But when, and this is one of the interesting th things he says, is when you work at slow speed, you have very little friction, but you do require a very, very long time to do it. And that's why I feel like the work presented here is actually imposing important questions about the nature of speed um, or slowness. Um, when we think about uh, remaking and remodeling and remanufacturing. I think the other um, aspect that Andrea's work really um, uh, brings to mind is also the idea of um, degradation and beauty, but also the idea of disgust and decay. Um, I've chosen this, issue, uh, this uh, image from, from one of Sam Taylor Wood's films. Um, just to kind of maybe illustrate a little bit what I might mean. And, and one of the things Andrea has talked a lot about is the idea of control. Um, and here you see in this fruit bowl, we have no control. Obviously the mold maybe produce, prefers something that's very sugary or has a very high water content. It can get in there first and then it chooses to spread through the other uh, materials. But um, how do we develop that level of mastery is actually quite, uh, it's somewhere I think where we're still at quite a nascent stage. If we think about the idea of the bioreactor as a kind of large vessel uh, where we have control, but a homoge homogeneous environment inside. Um, this is in stark contrast to, to what Andrea is doing, which is to try and bring things outside uh, and pattern and control and have form uh, as well as degradation. And the other um, kind of nice contrast is the idea of time-based processes. So yeah, I was thinking about um, kind of artworks that maybe uh, bring in that notion of time-based process. I've chosen this one from Tasta Dean, where she submerged a book in saline wa salty water um, and looked at the f uh, formation of crystals. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, I'm surely we're going to discuss today is the notion of um, time and again, this idea of control uh, when working with biology. What does it mean to, des to design slowly? And certainly in this kind of context, we're not looking at designing consumer pro uh, products, but indeed what is the role then of um, design with biology um, if we cannot make things at the speed um, of conventional manufacturing processes? But I would argue that our conventional manufacturing processes are highly broken and, and really need revisiting and questioning. So perhaps the idea of speed and this idea of creating a drop-in replacement is not really is not really relevant. And I thought it was really nice, um, Andrea talks very frankly about um, the ideas of contamination and proliferation of other species. And, and just, um, I suppose, one of the things I would think about as a biochemical engineer is what are the kind of uh, conditions that we need to create and foster to be able to control the growth or have more selective growth of the kind of species or the kind of organisms that we want to perform a certain function. 
But on the flip side of that, why can't we get used to uncontrolled and, and polycultural growth uh, on surfaces? And what does that mean, uh, certainly in terms of maybe health or um, our microbiomes, if these things are present within our built environment? Uh, and, and yeah, to sort of follow on on that topic was really, um, I, I absolutely loved the work on the enzyme degradation. Um, I thought it was absolutely fascinating, the kind of difference between the laser cut material uh, and the enzymatically um, degraded material and, and the kind of effects that that produces. And one of the things I thought that you had done, Andrea, which was incredibly clever, was to, to instead of trying to get the enzymes to recreate the laser cut was to actually revisit the form and design the geometry so that the enzyme activity and the, and the um, sort of voids that it produced were much more effectively displayed. And I would love to, in our, in our conversation today, delve much more deeply into how we use geometry to maybe control biological activity. I think it's one of the cards that we have up our sleeve that we can deploy really effectively, especially when we combine it with things like computation. And the other thing I kind of, uh, it sort of uh, prompted me to think about as well is um, going back into perhaps nature and, and going back into um, the kind of uh, amazing kind of biodiversity and toolkit that we have. And this is a picture of something called a gribble. Um, and what this organism does is it's also known as a shipworm uh, and it is capable of eating, uh, <laughs> is it capable of eating holes in the, in the wooden hulls of ships? And um, so obviously a bit of a pest. Um, the ability to degrade uh, lignocellulosic material is, is actually quite a skill. It's not that easy to do. Fungi are able to do it. Uh, termites so indeed are able to do it thanks to the gut bacteria that they have. But gribbles actually have a, have a sterile gut. So they're capable of producing uh, very specific enzymes to um, degrade lignocellulosic material. And, and what they did in, in this particular piece of work was they had cloned these enzymes out. So thinking again about the relationship between your design ambitions and biotechnology. So can we, uh, if you have a very specific set of, of, of aims that you wish to achieve with the kind of subtractive manufacturing process, how we can maybe look for better or more effective enzymes to do the task that you want. But also this paradox of working with materials that you wish to have certain structural properties like chitin, like, uh, or it could be cellulose or wood or whatever it is, um, that have certain, yeah, kind of uh, structural integrity, but then we may want to use a subtractive process, in which case we need to find some pretty um, special and pretty aggressive enzymes to be able to do that. And then just reflecting perhaps some of the relationship between your work and some of the things that we're really interested in, in, in BioID. So uh, this is a diagram from a paper um, uh, from one of our students, Shanil Malik, and it's really exploring the relationship between um, the kind of parameters when you're working in this area. So there's, a, there's obviously the design, there's what you want to achieve. Perhaps it's got certain um, functionalities that you want it to perform in, in context. Um, you have the material that you're working with and all of the um, amazing rheological and physical properties and limitations that it has. And certainly um, the relationship between water and biological life is a really important one, um, which you've also touched upon. But also then linking that to kind of fabrication too. So how can we use different um, modes and mechanisms of fabrication? I thought this, um, uh, this set of pieces that you had made were absolutely exquisite. Um, and I'd love to kind of probe a little bit more into uh, how we can uh, to push this further with this um, palette of materials that we currently have, but also what might be the materials that we might think about in future that we would like to develop and what properties might, they might have. So just to kind of close and um, maybe as a kind of to preempt some of the discussion is, um, I thought one of the things that was really fascinating from your work, Andrea, is the idea of working with an inside and industrial partner uh, partnership. So um, I know that uh, from talking to Natsai and, and, and from the people at Ginkgo, there's actually a huge amount of care put into developing the model um, for the creative residency at Ginkgo. Um, and when we see perhaps more and more companies wishing to host designers, I wonder what might be the equitable partnerships or frameworks that we need to put in place so that um, designers are also protected 
um, because when you're hugely creative and, and sparking lots of new ideas, uh, but you're working with a very big industrial partner, um, you may be slightly vulnerable in that relationship and it should be recognized. I think one of the things that you had talked about, Andrea, was this idea of like, what is the new business model? What are we making? Um, and what is the contribution of biological design in this uh, perhaps um, questioning of this sort of very linear capitalistic model? We're not just making more products that happen to be made out of cool biological stuff. I would be sort of very deeply disappointed if that was my only uh, output after a whole career in this area. But um, I would like to really to use our our platform to kind of question um, what what it means to make things with biology and, and, and are they just feeding into kind of business as usual? I hope not. Um, again, thinking about new uh, frameworks for collaborative research, I love that your residency picked up on things that were um, Natsai had done um, and you cite this and then you move, you know, you, you use this and incorporate this. And I love um, that I think the, the field of, of bio design is embracing a collaborative approach and that, that people are being credited and scientists and designers and are working in partnership, but also being recognized for their contributions. I think this is really important. And then finally, just maybe both uh, topics around the, or both points around a very similar topic, which is um, who are we designing for when we're working in these kind of ways? Is, is it, we're, we're really centered actually around the, the organism's needs uh, and what we wish it to do. So yeah, moving beyond um, design practices that are purely human centered and maybe trying to, um, to look at alternative ways of making um, that, that are more amenable to scale up as well. So yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. And yeah, I'd love to yeah, begin a bit of more of a dialogue and, and answer some of the questions in the, in the Q&A. Yeah, Brenda, these are really, really thought-provoking questions. Um, Thank you, uh, Brenda. That um, I, I think that was indeed, uh, like Andrea already said, uh, uh, a fantastic uh, reaction to her work. Uh, <laughs> also showing the collaboration, or, or not, not per se the collaboration you already, uh, because you know each other already and you know Ginkgo Bioworks. But um, it's interesting to see uh, the differences and similarities and the same questions popping up in the, the work you do at uh, UCL with uh, BioID and all the people that work at BioID. Mm. Um, I'm already uh, looking at some questions in the um, chat here. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry for showing both screens. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I uh, also saw the, saw the remarks and I even gave you a remark about that. But at the same time, it was also interesting to see some of your notes because they mm. also uh, uh, showed more insights uh, for if you want to look back uh, the, whole, um, the whole presentation. So I don't uh, uh, care so much. I think it was enriching even. Yeah. Mm. Um, let me see, how many people are we uh, in this call with? I think about... Um, Go about 25 of us. 25, yes. That's so, nice. um, let me think. Um, um, maybe, although in, in a physical situation, I always give the word first to uh, the audience, actually. Uh, uh, yet, because I want to start the conversation already, uh, I, I am taking the advantage of doing the first question myself. Uh, we're looking uh, uh, from both your works uh, um, to a larger extent at uh, microorganisms and the way we can work with them. Uh, uh, yet at the same time, fungi uh, um, are uh, single-celled or multi, uh, uh, multi-celled organisms that can grow very large. Um, I was also thinking about, um, uh, because it, it was also mentioned quite a few times, uh, the durational aspect of growing these uh, uh, co-cultures, uh, these kind of biomaterials. Uh, yet at the same time, um, I also know that artists are looking into uh, lichens, 
uh, algae, um, underwater creatures that make uh, chalks that, that resemble concrete materials. Um, a very interesting kind of organisms, uh, 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 species are sponges that actually uh, make chalky glass-like structures. How much are uh, the two of you looking into uh, other organisms than um, molds, bacteria, uh, and the kind of uh, materials they produce? Um, I think for me, uh, I am looking into other agents. It gets, I think, much more challenging as you get more complex organisms. And so I've been, this, this term, I've been doing a project with ants, right? And trying to guide them more in subtract, yeah. Uh, along the same lines of subtractive fabrication techniques, but guiding them where they dig their tunnels. Um, so I could design a structure and then hope that um, they, they do it, right? Um, and it's, it's really, one, it's surprising that I can guide them at all, I think. Like I use this UV light and they, they follow it, right? And, but they don't follow it in the most expected ways, right? So they might, they'll always end up at the, the where the light is in, in the end, but how they get there is very much about certain environmental conditions, which I'm still trying to figure out what is the trigger that they will do this tunnel versus another tunnel. Um, I think, you know, once it's so challenging, like moving from the different organisms um, with, with heightened complexity, just there's just so many more parameters that you have to figure out how to influence, I guess. Um, and I don't want to use the word control there because, because um, I don't think you can control natural agents, right? The way that you can control a machine. Um, you kind of have to work within its limitations. So. Yeah, that's right. I think you can control the environment or maybe you can or cannot to some extent or influence that, but you can't really um, necessarily predict how the biology will respond to that. And just picking up on your point, I think it, it's funny as someone who works mostly with microalgae, um, it's also, also quite humbling to realize um, just how difficult it is uh, to work even with one organism which you feel that you know quite well it doesn't actually owe us anything um, <laughs> as humans <laughs> to be amenable to to our uh, whimsical uh, aspirations in terms of what we want to design or make with it and I think this is one of the the keywords is the complexity um, as Andrea was saying so um, while it seems like it should be in theory easy to work with a single-celled organism it's actually um, ridiculously hard in many ways um mainly because we're also challenging them to to kind of do things that they don't normally do mm -hmm. um and i'm sort of moving up in complexity sort of working with things like higher plants as well again and um, they're also a product of their ecosystem so ultimately everything is um highly dependent on the on the little guys that you know the kind of um uh, you know, so the primary producers and the and the um, microbiomes that are associated with organisms. So, even when you try and design for higher species, you end up um, often having to control what's going on much much lower down. Um, and I guess there's some of this is at odds with where we want to get to, which is perhaps creating structures, creating visible things, um, and that's often, I guess. Uh, limitation of this field it's maybe a slight critique of this field that a lot of things that we show are exhibited in petri dishes um, and, and that's just a reflection of where we are at the minute with this kind of if we want to call it this a technology I don't know if Andrea you would call it a technology or how you would uh, yeah, an experiment right? yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, of course, a lot of the, the methods you use find their root in agriculture. So it's, it, I would say it's farming. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have the, the, the American-Japanese collaboration of another farm that is working with uh, silkworms that have a GFP 
protein introduced to uh, to light up under uh, UV light. So uh, um, I, I think that also feeds into a question we have from one of the people in our audience, Leonard Roussel, who's asking you about the distinction between collaboration with the species you work with, with the, the uh, also the the great difference between us as a species, uh, we are an ecology in ourselves and the, the microorganisms you work with. And uh, uh, what about the difference between collaboration and exploitation? Uh, I think there's in, in both the beginning of your presentations quite an answer to that, but maybe you, you can say some more. Right, so, um... Yeah, to shift focus away from human, I, for human-centered design, I have a, for me personally, I have a huge issue with human-centered design, I think, because the reason we're kind of in the trouble we are now, right, where we've maximized things like labor, money, and um, convenience, I guess, um, um, but the cost of that has been, you know, that, that we're all in quarantine right now, right? So, um, and so, yeah, I, what I'm really hoping for is if you're designing, that you're designing for two partners, right? So, um, and I'm hoping that the design is not just, or the design is not just um, using the other partner and milking them for all they're worth, right? Um, where, you know, the line between collaboration and export, uh, exploitation is really, really hard to define sometimes. Like, I don't know where that is. Like, when I'm working with the silkworms in mediated matter or working with the ants, I, I don't have an ant's mind, so I don't know if he's really bothered by this UV light source, but I do know he's somewhat attracted to it. So, um, and I think it's just kind of, um, with the, with the bugs, it's like, okay, if they can do this thing and we don't kill them, you know, we let them kind of live out their life cycle and I think it's okay, right? Um, with the microorganisms, that I'm not sure, maybe Brenda. <laughs> it's yeah, it's interesting Lucas uses the term farming as well, because that also implies some kind of duty of care and an ethical responsibility in, in production, um, if, if farming is indeed what we're doing. Um, it's a very, very um, interesting point. I think from my own experience, when I worked in you know, on a project related to algal biofuels and we were, our whole entire job was uh, growing the algae, stressing them out so they would make lots of lipid and then, and then squashing them to get it all out. That felt much more exploitative <laughs> than, um, than some of the current work that I do now, um, mainly because I suppose the objective um, of that particular project was to try and create a drop-in replacement. So that was to try and create something that was um, to supplement or sustain um, a type of human behavior um, that perhaps should be questioned. And I suppose with the remediation work, what we're trying to do is restore. Um, and I guess in the first instance, we are using lab-based uh, organisms because we wish to understand the world. And, and this is also, again, a key point about choosing model organisms for what you do, but with the ambition to perhaps go out and actually create conditions to enable the organisms that are present in the place to be able to perform this task. Um, so again, sort of always come back to this sort of stage of um, feeling that we're really at the beginning of this field. And um, the more we learn about the people that are the people, the organisms that we're working in partnership with, um, the more care and respect we will have for them. And I think it's also a really important role of exhibitions as well to bring people into that conversation and to induce dialogue. Um, quite a number of years ago, I worked with um, a landscape practice and we did a garden installation, an algae garden, which is all these hanging pods of algae. And we explained to people what role each of the species had in their everyday lives. People had no idea. Um, so again, it's about raising the visibility as well through the kind of different modes of communication that we have um, in the kind of design area where the biotechnology areas had absolutely no uh, visibility in that respect. They're just making things that look like other things that we already have. 
Okay, yeah. lots yeah. of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would like to give the, the, the word quickly to uh, Roland van Dierendonk, who is in this call, uh, and who has been responsible for um, uh, running the Biohack Academy here at, uh, at Vaag. So he comes from a background uh, of biology, design and arts. And I think the relation he makes between um, uh, farming, domestication of species, and the fact that many uh, biotech companies come from actually a computational background is interesting to see how that relation between uh, the complexity of uh, ecosystems wherein microorganisms thrive uh, is and how you want to synthesize those ecosystems in order to uh, to get a certain specific material quality with it, microorganism out of it. Roland, are you uh, are you in the call? You uh, uh, because you you have a, uh, a few more questions, so I invite you to uh, 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 to share them with us uh, uh, yourself. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you both for the presentation. So I just typed my. Um, question, I will repeat it again. So yeah, I, I find this um, issue of control or, or not control uh, with these microorganisms very interesting. And recently I was reading uh, the online magazine Grow by Ginkgo as well. And it had these two articles which were exactly about this topic. And um, one of them um, basically it raises the question, can we really control microorganisms from the bottom up or uh, and whether the field should be called synthetic biology or um, whether we should call it domestication. And I don't remember what the name was of the woman, but I can look it up. It was kind of the competitor of uh, Ginkgo Bioworks in conversation with uh, Tom Knight of Ginkgo Bioworks. And she said, basically, um, it is domestication because you cannot really convince uh, an organism to do something it doesn't want to do. And uh, everybody should know this because all these people who spend two months trying to grow and mold or bacteria in conditions that it doesn't like to um, uh, be in should know that you cannot really uh, force them in a way. So it, it, it's like really like uh, working with the organism against, against it uh, instead of against it. Um, anyway, I was curious for your perspective as des uh, designers on this because I think a lot of people in the field come from uh, computer science or engineering backgrounds as well, and you as a designer have a very own perspective on it. Right. I think it's interesting. I read that conversation, and I think with Tom Knight, he's really interesting. Like, he's been working in this field for so long, and uh, I would s see him on weekends in the lab working on, I can't remember the strain of bacteria, but he's trying to figure out what every gene in that bacteria does. And basically so that he can program it. And it's like a very simple, um, simple life form. Um, and he's been working on it for like 10 years, right? So, so it's not like, it's not a uh, control of, from bottom up is not an easy um, proposition. And so what I think Ginkgo does well is, um, and what a lot of bio designers I think should do is they try to find what organisms are already doing. Like Streptomyces, see the color, already makes those pigments. Um, and it does it without you having to ask it. Um, and so, you, so what you're controlling then is like the pH of the, the medium that they're in, the amount of light that it's exposed to. So I, I accidentally, I was trying to take photos and do like a time lapse. And so I was using it under like high light conditions and it started producing beta carotene instead and so it looked yellow um and it was like a lesson there it's like okay it needs dark to do these really these magentas and these indigos um and so that's where i think um scientists can get uh the most value i guess from from working with these organisms is like okay they're already doing these things um, and so it's not re-engineering them to do something that they are, won't want to do that, that like increases their metabolic load for no reason, right? Um, yeah, I don't know if Brenda has. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I think when I think about it, it's sort of synthetic biology and 
the idea of making constructs to do very specific things. And I think about kind of this idea of like inherently good design. So um, for instance, we take a property that we really like that we're interested in. So say it's a production of a pigment. Um, but we couple that metabolism with perhaps the ability to degrade a kind of waste product, which could be a sugar. Um, to me, that's not domestication. That's actually kind of very much going about things with a very much a deliberate design agenda. Um, so yeah, even thinking about my own work and the collaborations I have, we work with people who are genetically engineering algae because we want to free ourselves up from the dependence on land-based sugar um, to be able to make things, to manufacture products. Um, so we want to be able to use organisms that are naturally photosynthetic uh, and, and harness or tether those genes uh, to those kind of pathways. So um, I think that to me, there's a big difference between sort of domestication, which is taking maybe a wild type organism and then cultivating it or, or teaching it to grow in, in, in ways that um, we find more amenable. And um, so it's maybe a bit more like kind of the idea of brewing. Um, as opposed to, yeah, these very highly uh, constructed um, organisms, which only really have a function um, within this kind of, um, yeah, again, highly designed domain um, in which they exist. Yeah, and I think the kind of ideas from computer science and engineering, when we, it's really difficult to apply them to biology, I think, you know, we, we talk in those metaphors because it's what we understand. Yeah. But I don't think they're necessarily the best metaphors. Um, and, you know, I wrote about this a little bit where, you know, the metaphor, the way that we talk about computer computers and data processing that comes from extractive technologies, it comes from iron ore processing, right? And mm -hmm. so this kind of undercurrent of extractivism that like is the foundation of the language we use around synthetic biology is really problematic then because that means we can't understand biology on its own terms we're understanding it only in relation to capitalism and extractive technologies right? yeah i i see there is uh, uh more remarks of other people in the call that uh, that ask about um, yeah, how, how, how we lack actually the language um, to, um, yeah, to explore the relation between us, the other organisms, and uh, the frames where in which we are producing things uh, for our everyday lives. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, yeah. we even we even lack the vo vocabulary to communicate with each other. I mean, I'm sure Andrea maybe experienced this as a designer entering the lab for the first time, although I know you have a bit more of a background in biology, but I'm sure you observe the, just the challenges we even have of communicating with each other around the same, the same topics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yet at the same time, um, um, and I want to uh, to to move the conversation and a little bit to to uh, the collaboration between the humans uh, uh, in this area. Uh, you, with your findings uh, working at Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, criticize our um, exploitative relation to our natural environment very much, uh, being caught in this uh, 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 yeah extractive uh, way of uh, of using that environment. Yet at the same time, uh, uh, you work uh, at a company, Ginkgo Bioworks, that mm -hmm. of course uh, has a very different relation to the organism. It, it, it wants to, to research and train uh, to, uh, to make um, medication, uh, uh, other sort of materials that you are designing. Maybe it also has to do with the fact that you um, want to design materials that are um, uh, interesting for interiors, for clothing, uh, constructive materials instead of uh, signaling materials that you can use in a, in a medical application. Yet at the same time, uh, I, I think you also shared uh, the idea that Ginkgo Bioworks is a very fantastic organization to work with because it gives a lot of room to uh, to explore uh, 
the work you have been uh, developing there. So can you say something about how you have been working at Ginkgo Bioworks? Because that is also very interesting because we're doing a start stop. Eh? These kinds of collaborations are very meaningful to a lot of research uh, uh, efforts of uh, the European Commission uh, and all the universities uh, uh, it is funding at the moment. Right, great. And so I think the residency at Ginkgo is pretty unique. I don't know how, uh, like if it exists, I think Bolt Threads is trying to start one similar. Um, and I think a lot of the credit goes to Marcus and that by in starting this and, and um, having someone like Christina who is already a bio designer, right? She has a PhD in biomedical engineering, but she's already a bio designer um, and really heavily involved in, in bio design as an art form. Um, and then also having the you know the founders of Ginkgo to be open to criticism, right? Like to be open to having an artist kind of criticize, hey, you know, some of the stuff I think you're doing is exploitative, right? And, um, and you know, you're in a position, you know, they're, they're a startup, but they're like a $4 billion startup, right? So, um, like they're in a position where they can have this huge impact on the tra trajectory of where synthetic biology is going to go and like whether we're making products that kind of uh, or whether we're making things that um, service the same kind of um, exploitative foundations of, of how society works right now or whether you can change it and I do think that at least a lot of the staff I was working with like a lot of the scientists that they pair me with so I'm not just like working by myself there right um, the design work is by myself but uh, they paired me with a mycologist. They paired me with Josh Dunn, who who is like the lead of computational design there. Like in computational design for Ginkgo is like the computational design of genomes, right? Um, and then also with um, the Streptomyces team. And so all those people are extremely open to to you know having their work criticized or having some of these processes criticized, and, and it's not offensive or anything like that and it might be a virtue of just like i'm not a scientist right i'm not i'm like this outsider that they've brought in for for a short time um and so so uh like i'm not kind of uh a main project for any of these scientists but at the same time they're taking time out of their day to like think about these things so yeah yeah, so it's so it's not uh, so it's not uh, per se a matter of critiquing them, but challenging their mm -hmm. presumptions and mm -hmm. vice versa. Mm -hmm. Also uh, teaching you what can be done and what cannot be done. I think Brenda, you you will actually uh, share uh, similar there or not? Can you tell me something more about uh, about that relation to UCL? You're on the payroll there, but. Yeah, um, well, I have a huge position of privilege that I am um, at an academic institution that allows me a lot of freedom to do interdisciplinary work. Um, and one thing I, I suppose I'd like to say before I forget maybe is um, the value of kind of open-ended research. Quite often when a lot of these re uh, projects are constructed or people apply for funding, they have to give a very definitive end result. And design doesn't really work like that. And the best design uh, doesn't work like that where it's very deterministic you know we're going to spend three months and we're going to make this and um, what that um, kind of removes is the possibility for alternative outcomes and new and new ideas and challenges to the status quo so I mean I guess we have an amazing platform here because we're part of this sort of EU project and I would really appeal for um, when people are considering kind of circular economy projects or involving designers is to leave them with an open-ended remit as much as possible, but also to encourage this idea of hosting people. And I think um, the exchange that is allowed and encouraged and fostered when someone uh, leaves the design concept, context and moves into the lab for a period of time, or you invite people from the lab to move into the design studio for a period of time, this is beautiful. This is what I am... Um, I'm really fundamentally interested in with, with bio ideas, trying to increase that kind of crosstalk between these different environments um, 
it's absolutely wonderful uh, when that happens. And um, to, to give the designers the status as well, they're not merely there to make something beautiful out of your work uh, or it's purely for aesthetic reasons. It's to actually challenge the thinking um, as well. Um, and to me, that's, you know, fundamentally one of the roles of the designers in this whole type of ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I also want to encourage uh, uh, others in the, in the call to, uh, to come up with their questions, as we're not a very large group. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the setting is intimate enough uh, uh, to, to put on your video if you want uh, and raise your hands uh, and ask for, for the words to come up with your question. Uh, I would also, uh, uh, related to um, the, the, the mode of collaboration you have with Ginkgo Bioworks at the, um, the, what's it called, the Mediated Matter Group Laboratory, which is also a very uh, uh, challenging uh, and inspiring environment, but also at UCL. Uh, it's interesting to see how you challenge uh, uh, research uh, over and over uh, uh, amongst you and the, and the designers. But um, how is the, the, the development of biodesign also going to, to challenge uh, the economy of design, I would like to ask? Um. I think, you know, along the lines of what Brenda was saying before, uh, I think it's going to challenge these ideas of I'm going to design an object and it's going to be exactly what I've designed, right? So an architect, I do these construction drawings and if the contractor doesn't do build exactly what I drew, I can sue him, right? Or I can, you know, get really angry and like force him to do what I asked that's outlined in these specification drawings. You can't do that anymore in biology, right? And so you have to figure out different ways, um, very uh, much softer ways of, of exerting influence, um, of biasing behavior um, that is, uh, and then also of not, um, real, of realizing like certain limitations, I guess, especially, um, if you screw up the kind of metabolic environment too much, they'll all die, right? Like the, the, the species you're working with and, and then, um, so I think the idea of tolerances um, and expectation is really interesting. You know, if, if the blue that turns out from the bacteria isn't the right shade of blue, is that okay still? Um, and what does that mean when you're making products that you're trying to sell? So, yeah, um, Brenda, you have a, a reaction to that. Yeah, and again, it's maybe part of um, what we're trying to do here is is try and question the notion of what, what it is that that people really want uh, from biodesign, and and sort of just listening to what Andrea was just saying and thinking about the parallel conversation about weeds and here in the UK obviously no one's been mowing anything and we have this proliferation of plants that most people have never seen before and there's some amazing movements to try and educate people on the value and the beauty of these organisms and the role that they have in ecology whereas previously they were pulled up before they even had a chance to to, to start so again it's about perhaps we need to uh, recalibrate some of our expectations of what we can get uh, from this mode of working um, but also to maybe um, yeah again through the different ways that we have of, of communicating with people whether it's through objects and artifacts or whether it's through participation and um, have a different set of aspirations uh, for what we're trying to do rather than and what Andrea was saying is like make the perfect blue um, yeah, yeah, true. Uh, uh, we do workshops here and uh, Roland uh, and some other people in the calls and all about these uh, working with bacteria uh, to create pigments uh, to, um, uh, to color uh, textiles with. Um, yet I was also uh, uh, quite much interested in, and that also comes because I, I mentioned a few other sort of bio uh, uh, microorganisms, organisms we use for biomaterials. And of course we do that for centuries with wood. Um, um, but um, I was, I was uh, 
interested in questioning whether uh, microorganisms in this case uh, are organisms that we can expect more uh, material qualities of than the way they are trained in synthetic biology to to function as um, uh, as little factories that produce certain chemicals, signal substances that can interact with others, um, as, uh, as, as distinct from real material constructive qualities. Huh? The bricks you use in architecture or wovens or non-wovens as materials, like we saw in the, in the work uh, uh, Andrea did with the Mediated Matter Group. Yeah, I think just to kind of jump in quickly, I, I think we talked about this briefly before, I guess, before the audience joined, but we talked about the brick as a problematic unit of construction. And for me, the real turning point in Andrea's project was actually when she stopped trying to emulate the laser cutting, but actually changed the form so that the enzymatic degradation um, took place in a more interesting way. I thought that was terrific. And maybe, yeah, Andrea, you'd love to talk a little bit more about the role of, of geometry and form. Um, in and this new language and new um, sort of maybe set of typologies that we will have when we use biological uh, means to manufacture. Yeah, I think you know, uh, I, I guess a lot of modern architecture or, and industrial design is based on a rectangle, right? Like we're going to make these little boxes and that's very much a function of like how we, the technologies we had to make these things, right? And so um, once you're getting into biological technologies, you don't find rectangles in nature, you don't find cubes, right? Like they're like these extremely um, kind of highly branched and filamentous kind of structures. Um, and that's, you know, in order to get oxygen, in order to get nutrients, in order to get like uh, enough things um, within a volume that the thing can can survive, right? Um, and so, uh, I think a lot of the objects that we end up designing will have to take on some of these really irregular organic forms because, and, and not just not because of an aesthetic reason, but basically, it's not going to. Um, it's not going to live otherwise. Uh, like I work in a lab right now where a lot of the work is in bioprinting and trying to make um, synthetic uh, pancreas, right? So uh, if you, and if you put too much tissue together without any vessels, it becomes necrotic. It's not like there's no oxygen getting into the middle of the mass. And so like these type of forms that we're used to working with in industrial ways, they're not, they don't work. Right, they don't work with living organisms. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I 100% agree. Yeah, the idea yeah. of vasculature and um, more organic forms. I mean, I'm sort of bored of modernism as well. So why not create more interesting um, mm -hmm. forms, but also be more guided by um, the the medium with which we're working, which is biology, uh, which requires a completely different um, set of Sort of surface area to volume propositions than um than what we have you know and i think this is where we run into problems and I, by trying to emulate things that are already there and um, okay. so i guess making for instance making a brick out of mycelium is an interesting activity to try and prove scale um, and to try and relate uh this to something that people are familiar with so that they can maybe experience it in a different way but then the next stage is to actually look at what are the geometries and um, that mycelium materials naturally lend themselves to, or what could they be incorporated with? So it's not just monomaterialistic as well. Because um, again, that's, as Andre said, it's not actually how biology functions um, in the wild per se. Getting, getting hybrid materials. Yes. Would, really, would be really advantageous. And it might be a way of getting some of these biological materials to scale. Like if you can't, you can't grow enough um, mycelium to get to a building scale or something like that. You know, can you can you blend it with something else so you grow it on top of a substrate that can get to that scale? Yeah, I think that's what I'm really excited about in the next few years is like working with um, kind of 
partnerships of organisms working with polycultures and 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 um in, in thinking about this in a completely different way than trying to you know battle sterility all the time but you know um yeah. and this idea of purity what that means is, is an interesting one yeah a, a, a bit further uh, back in the chat um uh, Inger Le Goulouet came with a, a very interesting remark that relates to the complexity of uh, uh, ecosystems wherein you grow uh, microorganisms. Uh, and we tend to mimic those, but we lack the, uh, our machinic metaphors of mimicking that uh, is lacking because it's not additive manufacturing uh, or that. And also, uh, the ecology is also managing us. If you look at an evolutionary perspective, it's actually pigs that thrive well because of uh, humans, because there's millions of pigs that would not be there without humans in a way. So there is this, this, this interaction between us and other organisms that you can also reverse, uh, and it needs um, a much more complex approach uh, also to the parts of the, the, the organisms you're working with. Um, um, Mark Gorbet, you have a question uh, I see in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, you're muted hi. still. Yeah. Yeah, hi, okay. sorry. Matt, um, Matt Gorbet. Um, hi, Andrea. Um, very, very inspiring stuff. Really amazing presentation and discussion. Um, the thing that it makes me question or wonder about is so much of this is 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 radically challenging notions of of what is uh, good design or normal design or you know the design that many people have been brought up with um, in terms of aesthetic in terms of processes in terms of reproducibility all the metrics of success and there's so much in this discussion about about sort of challenging that and proposing a different way a different model a different philosophy so at a higher level sort of from the point of view of the design as a as a practice or as an industry and also in teaching design um how do each of you see uh the work you're doing and this kind of um these kind of new aesthetics and new philosophies um evolving in in um in relation to current design do you see because i i i, I I'm anticipating that there's a danger that we have silos, that we have like, oh, okay, this is bio design over here and it's doing this thing. And then this is the more traditional design or the modernist design or everything else. And how, like, should they connect? Are there baby steps for getting some of this into, into what we currently have? Um, what, what should happen there? I'm really curious about both of your, your uh, responses there. Um, I think by calling it biodesign, we immediately put it into a silo. We we say that you should treat it differently, and I firmly believe that that shouldn't be the case. But I'm not as shackled, perhaps, as other people because I'm not a designer at all. I'm a biochemical engineer, so I, I'm pretty much free to muddle up all my metaphors as much as I like. Um, but yes, I I think that by labeling things biodesign and keeping them in that box. Um, is going to be problematic for the field. So that's why I think I'm particularly intrigued by the collaboration with architecture because architecture is not just about buildings or the built environment, it's also about systems and ways of thinking and doing. Um, and that's why I think for me, it's, it's really fulfilling to think about this in the context of architecture as opposed to maybe product design where I'm trying to make the next thing that somebody wants. I do want to make things that people want and like and appreciate and, and have an aesthetic component. Um, but I also want to make things that have perhaps a function or a reason um, or a, a sort of whole system that it sits behind or in between um, as opposed to just kind of um, looking kind of cool or being desirable um, in that one-liner kind of way. It's a, this idea we talk about a lot in biology, this multi-layered approach to, to the way we design things. Yeah, I think I think that's kind of one of the advantages of working in architecture because a lot of it in a lot of architecture is still custom, right? So you're not trying to mass produce mm -hmm. anything, um, and make the same building unless it's like a spec house for a developer or something like that. Um, but there's still like a very large market of architecture which is experimental or um, you know even working in Toronto. 
I've worked on projects where we're like, okay, we'll try this fabrication technique. It hasn't been done before, but you know, the client's okay with us trying it because it gives us a new type of screen system or something like that. Um, I think in industrial design, it's, it's a lot harder and like probably the first avenue of getting it into industry maybe is like in products that are disposable, right? Or hmm, I remember having a conversation with uh, a team from Nike um, and they had 3D printed that, sh that shoe for the Kenyan marathon runner who like beat the two hour marathon or something. Um, and they told me that, you know, like really advanced runners like that, they go through shoes like once every run, right? And so, so like a product like that, I think, you know, maybe I was like, or some of the things I'm saying, like disposable trans products um, that disappear um, could have a place uh, rather than making it out of foam, right? So um, in terms of moving it into education, <laughs> um, I don't know, I feel like Brenda probably, like she's, she's the teacher, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's sort of, well, um, or oh, am I a teacher? I think I'm putting people in situations and exposing them to things and utterly confusing them perhaps sometimes. But um, what I hope is uh, to some extent that bio, the kind of approach that we're doing will then become so embedded in other people's practices that I can then retire and, you know, um, um, go and open up my tea shop in the Himalayas. You know, that's going to, you know, every, everyone will be integrating biology into design at some point because the tools to do so will become more accessible and the notions will become so much more pervasive in the way that we don't think about using a computer nowadays. You know, um, we would just think about what the, you know, maybe the biological system that's fit for purpose or, or serves the, the use that we want to do. So, um, yeah, I, I sort of take a lot of joy in thinking that some t at some point I'll become redundant. I'll not become special anymore and that's fine. I'm actually quite cool with that, but I think I've got a while to go, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you both. Yeah. That was really interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I'm also looking at time. Uh, mm -hmm. I see there's more questions, but uh, at the same time, uh, I think also for, for uh, the reason we are recording this, it is interesting to, uh, to wrap here. Um, I think uh, in the chat you, uh, you find uh, uh, each other. Uh, if you want, you can probably also uh, find Andrea and Brenda if you have yeah. further questions <laughs> uh, via email, via Facebook, uh, uh, or whatever. Um, Andrea's artwork is going to be shown um, in September in uh, Linz, Austria, at uh, the Ars Electronica Festival that actually hosts uh, the exhibition of the Starts Prize winners and the honorary mentions. And that is, um, I think, um, the second week uh, of September. Unfortunately, that's going to uh, not allow the enormous numbers of audiences uh, coming to, to Austria this year due to Corona limitations. Uh, but uh, on the Friday, there is a starts day uh, where a lot of uh, um, the starts projects but also, again, uh, Andrea's work will be shown uh, and given the, nom the, the, the Starts Prize, uh, actually. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Andrea and Brenda, uh, for this fantastic uh, uh, discussion and your fantastic presentations that inspired me much, also what we do here at the Wet Lab, uh, and also with uh, quite a few of the, the, the people that are in uh, this presentation, Roland, um, uh, Inger Lugelue and I also say, uh, saw Maarten uh, Duursma. So I want to thank you. Um, we're going to wrap this. Uh, unfortunately, I will go to a bar to have a drink without you. <laughs> really what we miss in Zoom, uh, because I think all the, the, the conversations after these meetings are very meaningful. Um, we are also going to go into a summer break, and after the summer break, we are going to be back with more start talks uh, around the other um, um, projects of the Starts Prize. Uh, um, and I wrote them down somewhere. <laughs>
Um, these are other people that uh, also won. It's uh, Olga Kiseleva with a project, but it's also people like Pei Ying Ling, who's also in biodesign working with viruses, uh, and people like uh, Paolo Chiri, who's making artworks with the Patent Office of Europe. Um, I hope to see you um, back then. Um, we will send out announcements of these new starts calls. Um, and uh, yeah, for now, I, I once more want to, to thank uh, Andrea, Brenda, and you, the audience, uh, for being here uh, with this fantastic presentation and this fantastic conversation afterwards. Uh, please stay tuned for more on starts um, in August um, via Waag.org, but also through our partners Bozar in Brussels and uh, the Arts Electronica Festival in Linz. And I also want to lastly thank you, uh, uh, thank the European Commission for making this all possible. And if you want to know more about the Starts project, uh, please visit starts.eu. Thank you all, and uh, uh, I wish you a nice afternoon in, uh, in New York, Andrea, and, uh, and a super nice evening uh, here in mainland Europe. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.